in three, two, <laughs> sorry, starting in three, two, one, with trying to make this debate actually orderly and organized and having fun. Let's talk about motions that are this more harm than good because I hate them. The comparative here is that is that when they don't do it, it when they do it less before the rise, they still do it to some extent in the most extreme cases. I'll give you an example. When you say that the poor are being oppressed, it is widely known for the last 20 years that we acknowledge that African Americans are disadvantaged for in, in the United States, for example. And for that reason, when there is extreme lack of intersectionality, we think that even before the rise, it was criticized. And so we only have to prove that the rise, when we do it excessively, does more, does more harm than good. Second thing, I think that left and left-leaning NGOs is mostly people who want more right, more, more, more liberal, more change to the status quo, etc. Last thing, we think we think that largely we accept that all oppression is is, is bad. Uh, you know, all oppression is bad, and that having less oppression is good. Yes, I'll take you. This motion isn't that this house supports the rise. You have to defend it being entirely good or entirely bad. Yes, I know. I'm going to show you completely why it's more harm than good. I don't understand this uh, this clarification. Last thing I want, I want to say that intersectionality as defined by motion clarifications is that all oppression is linked. So not necessarily just the examples in the infocide, but also that feminism and, and Black Lives Matter have to work together to, to face the system and can't do it on their own. So with that, let's try to make an orderly debate. What do we think that happens? Basically, we think that pushing intersectionality by criticizing NGOs means that they attempt to be more intersectional. Means that uh, mean that they focus focus more on uh, on combining the values, combining the uh, combining the oppressions, and facing and facing them together. Why do we uh, and? To, to, and because of the criticism that they get, they want followers, they want to enact the change, a tech, a tech, this will come later in my speech. But the key mechanism, the key burden that I want to push and prove is that, sorry, oppressions have different systematic problems and solving one of them doesn't necessarily mean solving the other and even abstracting them and solving something in the middle does harm to both. Let's start with why I think everyone has a difference. Every type of oppression has its own cultural, historical origins that are different. The systematic problem is different. There's no one solution that solves all, right? If it's police brutality, it comes from the over-immunity of, 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 the, of the police, and so they're not prosecuted, they're not held accountable, they really do things that we think are morally wrong, and by the law are, are, are wrong. Discrimination against women in the workplace comes from both prejudice, but mostly because, yes, women have some different needs. Sorry, men don't give birth. They don't, they, they don't, they don't, they, they don't need uh, to, to go on, uh, on leave for, for, for childbirth. And so together with actually having some different conditions that need accommodation, people are also very, very, uh, have the prejudice against it. Let's continue. I think that, uh, I'll take you at five. I, I, I think that exploitation of labor, right, uh, extreme capitalism, is not the same as prejudice against Afri African Americans or the fact that it's because of historical reasons they are more poor, more disadvantaged, and have a different reason. Or um, that I said. What I'm saying here is that the likely case are that all different, all the different are uh, all of these sort of different things are. Different. Okay, they have different systematic reasons. Why? Because of all of the examples, and this is most of the cases. But second, because and this is structurally, if they had the same systematic problem, they would already be the same movement. By that I mean, if African Americans <coughs> in Atlanta face one sort of oppression, and African Americans in New York say safe and we face the same kind of oppression, even though they are geographically different, geographically different movements, they join together to face to face the same oppressor. What ha what happens on our side? First of all, I think that NGOs don't have enough resources to focus on everything. 
And so in the same detail that they would if they would focus on one thing on their own, if they want pressure to do, uh, to, to do it on, on their own, which means that they lose the, nu the, the nuance. Their messaging, uh, their messaging is, more is more abstract. It's not specifically on the problem and a call to a specific change. But also, in order to combine them, you strip the nuance. You don't address the core issue. You call for the wrong change. You say the only solution is to fuck capitalism and change to a different system. Capitalism might solve, solve extreme capitalism might solve the specific the, the specific problem uh, of people of sweatshops, for example. But it won't solve. But it won't 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 solve, won't solve the pro the problem of police brutality, right? And and so you're driving the wrong problem. And from the I'll say closing. Most of these policies aren't actually costly. Having a diverse workforce isn't something which costs you any more money. Yes, but political action of the people that you want to vote, you want to protest, is. And that is exactly what I say. You're driving people away, right? Not all the people who support who, who are oppose neo-capitalism also oppose police brutality. Maybe they're not aware. Maybe they don't face it in the in the day to day, so they don't think it's that extreme. They downplay it. But that is most of society for most of the systems of oppression, because most people are not oppressed by everything, they're oppressed by one of by, by one of them. Which means that they are unwi unwilling or don't understand why they have to support the other thing. Why do they have to go out to protest? I know that protesting is an extreme act to do. It means disrupting my day, disrupting the life of others. And lastly, motivation. I think that just the activists have less motivation and for simple and, and support and less supporters for a simple reason. If everything is linked together, the only way to enact change is to overthrow everything. That is a huge burden. That is very, very uh, demotivating. Because what are the odds that I will be the difference to change the whole system, change capitalism, change the, the foreign affairs of the United States, change the way everybody behaves in the workplace? On the other hand, I'm facing one problem. The problem might be big, but it's a problem that if we gain together, we have uh, the, the people which are more people, so more likely to, to more likely go out. What does this mean? More people, more, more, more motivation, calling for better actions. It means that you have more political support to enact the change. You have more motivation to put up fires, more motivation to protest, more motivations to call your senator to change the form of, the, 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 the form of oppression. And you're calling for the correct actions and not some ambiguous thing. For all these reasons, I'll shut up. Sign speech in three, two, one. Look, we in, sorry. Sorry, this time my bad. Sorry, starting my speech in three, two, one. Look, what we're going to push here on our own is generally this sort of criticism is a good thing because intersectionality is a good thing based on is a good thing for the people to care about and based on what they care about, it is good for NGOs that they get more buy-in to cause more social change. So generally, the criticism from the left is a good thing. Therefore, more good than harm. I want to do some quick responses towards OG because I think if you, I feel like the way they characterize non-government organizations, NGOs, is a bit weird. It's like they're treating NGOs as like political parties, as in they seem to say like, ah, oh, you can't focus on everything, uh, and therefore it's expensive, and it's better to focus on one thing. Look, NGOs are not strictly political parties, okay? The majority buy-in is not, it's, not it's not necessary for them to do good in the world, right? It is, of course, good, it is all beneficial for them to have more buy-in, but it's not a tangible way. It's not intrinsically linked to their success or not, because it's not a political party. You don't need to win an election or anything. You can based on what the political party is, but I'll get into that when I characterize further. But I think the way OG characterizes NGOs is done in a way that kind of detracts from the impact the true impact of this motion, which is how much change can NGOs actually get, and how criticism interacts with that paradigm. Cool, let's actually go into this right now, right? Let's, I think it's important to understand how NGOs operate and what are the incentives within the status quo, right? Any NGO, whether left wing or right wing or whatever the fuck, right? The main goal is going to be what their advertised social change, societal changes, right? Whatever their mission statement is, right? For example, in this motion, uh, NGOs uh, want abortion rights or whatever, right? Uh, so how do NGOs normally do this, right? It's based on what this NGO operates in, but it looks, 
but I, we're going to just take a broad swath here, right? This looks like protest, this could look like campaign, this could look like organizing political movements, this could look like endorsement of certain candidates, it could look like even, it could even be as, as direct towards affected communities, like offering aid towards people affected by certain things, like uh, uh, helping people who need to go through like abortion rights or something like that, right? Or like health campaigning for like societal movements or helping those who are affected by uh, the lack of unions or something like that, right? So, how do they actually gain the capability to forward this large spectrum of like different actions that they could take as an NGO, right? This is this is how they need to rely on some degree of public buy-in, right? Voters or like sponsors for these NGOs need to have a willingness to find the NGO they want and also donate and contribute to the NGO central mission, right? This look, this could look like donations from the lay persons, this could look like donations from like organizations, whether they be external organizations that are not NGOs, this could look like political groups, social groups, or even like supportive all of or rich people or corporations who are in support of this NGO in the first place, right? Note that this analysis shows that what it is, is as long as there is some degree of public buy-in and willingness to donate from a certain group of members, it is enough for this NGO to do certain actions that benefit a community or benefit towards the central mission statement that's trying to do in the world, right? So why do NGOs, so and note that NGOs care about this factor more than any other in, term, in terms of their analysis and incentives, right? Because A, it is logically prior to access our main goal of like mobilization and impact and society benefit, right? And B, recognize that the scale of change accessible to this NGO scales with the amount of public buy-in and therefore donations that they actually get from this group, right? It, this looks like we, we can simply get, give more aid to people affected by our organization if we just have more uh, campaigning and stuff like that, right? And also finally, people are, also, I think it's also recognized and characterized that people working in these NGOs are likely able to contribute even if they get less potential benefit or whatever, right? Knowing as you're going into NGO, knowing you're not going to get paid much as if you were working in like a Fortune 500 company. I believe people in these NGOs probably are very motivated towards their like passion or whatever, right? Cool. Based on all this characterization, let's move on to the main point of why criticism matters to NGOs and why it's a good thing, right? Because criticism directly affects public perception uh, for the NGO from their supporters, right? Which directly affects the degree of buy-in that they're willing to do, right? Simply put, if people feel like the NGO that they're supporting is a poor choice, then therefore they want to donate less, which therefore directly scales back their degree of change accessible to this NGO, right? This doesn't rely on whether or not OG wants to defend, defend or counter the intersectionality is a good thing, right? As long as the liberal left believe that intersectionality is a good thing that they should support with any NGO, then because they're will, more willing to donate and buy into these uh, NGOs, therefore that directly scales up their degree of change accessible to them, creating more group within the world, right? They're, because this directly uh, impacts their goal in a positive manner, it is a, it is a, uh, it is, sorry, it is the likely the best way because it is the most direct to motivate NGOs to change, right? To make them accept the sort of intersectionality in a way that benefits buy-in and therefore benefits their degree of uh, change accessible to them. Cool, let's also move on to a slightly different, in terms of, in, in, in case to mitigate anything coming up from uh, DPM or close, right? Um, I want to also characterize left-wing demographics and analyze, and from this, analyze what that criticism is like to look like. Uh, before I move on, Charles, to close yeah. How do you think this will affect international NGOs like the WWF? I think it interacts just fine. I'm going to go into left demographics and tell you why they just generally believe in intersectionality anyway, and why, even though, in regardless of whether that's a good thing or not, you should probably vote, uh, cater to this group anyway. Cool, look, left-wing supporters are generally care about all of the issues on the liberal left, right? But I would posit they're supported to different degrees based on what their personal experience is going to be, right? But the core thing is, is that they, are, they generally care about most of these issues as proven by the motion being about intersectionality in the first place and seeing that there is this criticism in the first place, right? Because of their belief in general issues, just a different degree of support. The, what they choose to invest in, or what NGO they choose to like financially support or like donate to, is likely going to be based around what their main concern is. As I've said, right, because people prioritize support in different areas, what they're donating to is likely going to be what they care about most. Because they care about, let's say, workers' rights most, they're probably going to donate to a worker union the most, as their top priority in terms of what NGOs they support. If you care about abortion rights the most, you're probably going to donate to abortion, 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 sorry, abortion rights uh, NGOs and stuff like that, right? So, but when they care about intersection, but clearly when there is criticism about intersectionality, intersectionality also becomes a valid criti criticism point for this motion to even exist in the first place, right? Therefore, what is likely to happen is that this criticism is unlikely to be completely destructive against this NGO. So this just mitigates anything uh, if 
uh, if uh, sorry, if CG or like even the DPM wants to somehow recognize that like NGOs are fully washed out and fully destroyed because of the criticism or whatever of public life, right? Recognize that because people at their core want to support the NGO they're donating to the most, even if they are not completely intersectional, the way that they criticize at these NGOs are public is probably not going to be completely destructive. And instead, of campaigning for more change happening organically within these NGOs. Um, finally, I just want to push burden push onto OG here. Given the fact that you believe that the living criticism of NGOs fails to bring more harm than good, you need to tell me what that harm actually is besides just intersectionality bad or whatever. I think it's also important for them to tell us whether or not there is a way for NGOs to further change and what is this alternative mechanism. Thank you. explain how uh, criticism actually helps the motivation of uh, activists uh, and of supporters of those causes. I'm going to do a bunch of weighing and I'm going to explain why we win this debate. All right, okay. Now, what do we get from all? All tell us that NGOs aren't political parties. Now, public support is directly correlated to public donations, right? Vast majority of funding goes there. And a number of volunteers and their motivation to put in hours. Secondly, political movements, not party affiliated, have lending NGOs that organize protests and organize their call for change. Success depends on population actually taking part. Okay, uh, and lastly, uh, uh, OO tell us that uh, criticisms, criticism helps organization change, but they miss a burden of telling us why that change is good, given that we show you that uh, the purposes of, of, uh, of different uh, causes are different, meaning there will always be someone complaining, someone unhappy, because his, uh, his, uh, 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 he, the NGO isn't effective at uh, advancing, advancing his cause. Therefore, the organization will continue to try to change and will uh, not focus on one specific, uh, one specific cause, which demands a lot of work to actually change effectively. And uh, they tell us to look about, uh, to explain how that uh, uh, harm uh, looks like. Well, the harm is there being no change, right? We agree totally on first half that the most important thing in this debate is where the, there is no harm, and we'll get to why uh, we do it better. All right, uh, I'm going to explain why there is uh, the criticism helps the criticism helps the motivations of uh, of uh, the allies of the cause. Why? Because the the organizations. Uh, already stand under a lot of criticisms from uh, non-liberal uh, bodies, it can be uh, other NGOs, it can be other uh, uh, political parties, so forth. And generally, those uh, our NGOs want to uh, advance change, want to change their status quo, meaning uh, also people who aren't affiliated with any cause will also uh, criticize them because they're changing something that people know about. Uh, in fact, the only people who actually support those uh, uh, NGOs are the liberal camp, right? And once the liberals attack them, they have no public support, right? They have no allies. And what does that do in the eyes of the average liberal supporter of those causes? It, the criticism uh, is done by the people I look up to the most, right? I care about their opinion the most. It can be influencers I care about. It can be my friend. It's not just uh, Republicans who uh, say things that I don't care about. It's people who I actually value their opinion. Secondly, the criticism talks to me on a, on a much uh, uh, basic level, on a much higher level, because it talks to me in my values, right? Uh, those are problems that I care deeply about, and now, and, and now uh, I see that those NGOs aren't advancing those causes that I care about as effectively as I would have wanted. And therefore, the criticism is especially effective on me, and therefore I will lose hope and, uh, in those uh, NGOs to promote change, and I will support them less. All right, now, note that the most important thing in this debate is whether uh, where there is the most, um, the most change for good. Before I get to my weighing, uh, I'll take a second, yeah. If the only group of people who support you are liberals and they're criticizing you, surely this is the greatest incentive to make change. Yeah, but what we tell you is that 
it, uh, no matter what, liberals will, uh, uh, will criticize it. Why? Because now, uh, one camp, uh, BLM, whatever, uh, criticizes it for one thing. You change in order to please to them. And then another camp, like feminists, or I don't know, uh, criticizes you for missing out, uh, for not advancing their causes, and therefore will always be criticized. It's, uh, it's inevitable. All right. Now, uh, in order to make change, as I said, it's the most important thing, you need to think. You need activists with motivation, and you need a huge amount of activists. Why? Because look at demonstrations and protests. You need a mass of people. Without it, a demonstration is seen as radical activists. It gives legitimacy to your message. And you need those people to have motivation in order to cause disrupt, in order to, for them to actually spend their day at the protest, for them to block roads, for them to uh, uh, cause, uh, cause disarray. You need motivation. Secondly, donations. In order to function as an NGO, you need donations from a lot of people. A lot of people with, uh, um, from a lot of people. Um, because you're a grassroots movement, you are probably backed by powerful bodies. But even if you are, people with motivation um, uh, donate you more money. Uh, lastly, uh, you need, uh, you need uh, 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 lastly, on a political uh, pressure level. Change demands uh, political pressure. When the government think that, thinks that you're representing a message of a large show of popularity, he can't ignore you, right? He has electoral uh, incentives. Uh, lastly, you have a, 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 a kind of a, a, a friends bring a friend uh, uh, a mechanism here. There is a snowball effect. In order to increase the size of my movement, I need people to spread the word further. I need friends who uh, talk with each other, uh, people who, uh, activists who put up flyers and so forth in order to advance my movement, movement even further and increase it in their size. Yeah, I'll take you uh, open. Look, OGC, the intersectionality is good because social issues are linked and need to be linked to be solved, right? Which means that NGOs that do address intersectionality are better than those that can. No, no, we specifically tell you that the view of intersectionality harms you because it, uh, it's, uh, it loses the nuance to the uh, in, it loses the needed nuance to make the actual change. I'm going to uh, respond to it a bit more on that. Why do I need that nuance in order to create a change? The nuance nuance is critical because, like Nebo tells you, every problem here is different. The solutions are different. In order to combat police brutality, in order to combat uh, uh, female uh, uh, discrimination, and so forth, you need to, to attack different things. You lose your effectiveness. Uh, when you don't attack the same problem, but go instead for the big things, the things that are the most uh, in consensus about, because um, you, w you want to, uh, to go after the big things, because uh, you will uh, avoid the most, uh, the most criticism that way. And once you go for the big things and not the nuance that you actually need to take care of, you become ineffective. And what does that cause? The ineffectiveness actually feeds further the lack of motivation that, both, uh, that uh, your uh, uh, activists have. Why? Because people now believe less that the fight actually works because it's less effective. So they say, OK, I'm wasting my time in something that doesn't actually do anything. And for all those reasons, we beg you to support. No one solution solves it all, right? I think this is exactly the point of intersectionality, and it's exactly why it's good, right? Because there's a misunderstanding here. It's not that like all solutions have to be different. Like, of course, like the majority of things, um, things like Black Lives Matter movement and some aspects of the feminist movement are going to have possibly different solutions to them, right? But there are significant areas and demographics of these kind of movements, of these kind of policies that overlap. These are the demographics that need more of a voice, and these are the demographics that intersectionality gives a voice to, and these are important, right? Like, by their own statement, social issues are linked. Um, so this means that if you can find a way to um, to treat those issues where they overlap, for example, i.e. intersectionality, this is a good thing, and NGOs that exhibit this, um, therefore give more benefit to the social movement they represent. This involves more buy-in, more donations, um, more campaigning, more lobbying, more activism for these NGOs. This is a good thing, right? Like, okay, I think 
I think the harm from OG is that we get we like we get the thing about like, the strain on resources, right? I'm going to tell you that it's unlikely for an NGO to like completely fail under criticism from the left. Why is this? Because I think to get to like um, the status of being a non-governmental organisation, right? You probably have a fair amount of large support already, right? Like from the liberal camp, for example. Um, you probably have uh, like donors from other institutions. You probably have a, a, a fair a fair amount. I think it's fair to say that you have a fair amount of, like voice in the media and things like that, right? Like you, for example, international organisations, right? Um, so I don't think it's likely that an NGO is going to like crumble under this possible strain of resources you buy it. I think what's more likely to happen is resources are going to be diverted, right? Like I think it looks like diverting and rearranging resources. For example, right? And I think this is like the point of um, intersectionality here as well. Like liberal NGOs currently do operate on like a one size fits all solution. For example, if they were to um, so, um, fund like Planned Parenthood and like abortion clinics in a certain certain area, probably equal funding would go across that area. I think the point at which intersectionality comes in is, for example, things like sending more funding or different types of funding to like more impoverished areas, because these are the, probably the areas that need slightly more funding or a slightly different type of abortion clinic. I think this is where you get that change, right? That intersectionality is good. And this is what this is a good thing for the social movements, this is a good thing for the NGOs. Don't take what I can do no help. Northern Brooklyn LGBTQ NGO doesn't have massive donations from the outside. They're a small community and they donate to themselves, relying on their own support. I don't, uh, but I don't think this is likely to fail, right? Like, I think the point at which you're likely to fail because you don't have resources is where you, like, you have very, very minimal support. Like, you're an ex like a fringe movement, maybe an organization right, right in the beginning. I think to reach like NGO status, even if you're a small NGO, you need to have some amount of buy-in that is not going to go away because you're going to keep these, right? Like, um. I think I think if we weigh up like the increased buy-in that we show you that like um, the fact that the message reaches further because now you have more people um, thinking like hey my problems being represented here like my problems um, as an ethnic minority and a woman and how those intersect are now being represented here rather than just being a one size fits all solution for all women I think you get like increased yeah increased buy-in increased donations you get a message reaching further you get increased campaigning I think we win there like weighing that against if you buy it, there is like a loss a slight loss of resources because they're uh, trying to like solve a lot of different problems at once for a, a, a different group um i think we went on like pure quantity of support here right like it, this also works to increase your resources as well because just like the initial like donations are going to get you more money to buy resources um and i think like again the, the idea of like campaigning for more nuanced things rather than what you see like i think i think in a lot in, in a lot of societies um where ngos are operating right like you they know the headlines of major like left wing um, movements, right? You know, like, we know we know things like um, the headlines like pride movements, and so I think campaigning for more nuanced things, which happens under intersectionality, leads you to more like media coverage, for example, right? I think all of this outweighs like any possible strain on resources, given that like power of characterization of NGOs, like your buy-in is probably the most important metric here, right? Um, your like donations awareness coverage. Why is it the criticism specifically left wing, um, left wing criticism tends to do more harm? As my partner said, when at the point at which you are not a political party and you don't get votes, right, you get you get things more like awareness and campaigning. Um, and Jews have a responsibility to listen to the voices of the people that represent. Otherwise, strictly, they don't know where to divert resources. They don't know how to um, they don't know how to campaign properly for change in social movement, which we've agreed is like an important thing to succeed, right? Um, I think criticism. I think criticism ha has a unique stance in that. Um, if you feel criticism from the people that you have a responsibility to represent, and it's likely that those in charge of an NGO feel that responsibility, right? Like the, they have an incentive to feel. If you uh, if you are taking um, criticism um, from people, it's, it's probably likely to be like on media and things like that. If you're taking criticism from the people that you are likely to represent, um, you are more likely to change because they are your priority, right? Like they, um, NGOs have, um, and just have a motivation to help those people, right? I think criticism is probably going to look like, um, I think left-wing criticism is probably not going to look um, as incredibly harmful or like, um, like malicious as, um, op, um, as government might want you to believe. Reason being, because these people, their criticism come from a section of intersectionality, they have recognized that there are overlaps between certain demographics and certain problems. I think this criticism is likely to be very constructive, given that, um, as a whole, even though the, um, the whole of the left-wing movement and liberal movements have probably um, have slightly different demographics, slightly different views. I think as a whole, um, their overall motivation is to progress social movement, less oppression given by OG in their, in their speech, right? I think at that point, I think your criticism was more likely to be constructive and energy is more likely to um, like listen to this, right? I would also weigh up like, um, so why is it a good thing that NGOs get more aid and support um, versus like 
maybe like political party getting more aid and support, right? I think there's like a view of NGOs um, across the whole left-wing cabinet, even if you have criticism of them, as a fairly like do-good thing, right? An ability to connect with many people, which is exactly where it's important to involve intersectionality so you can reach as wide an audience as possible, as wide a buy-in as possible. Whereas in political parties, there's often like more bureaucracy, more barriers to this. I think NGOs is where the change of social movement happens, and this can only happen if they listen to people. This can only happen if they listen to in, like as many individual experiences as possible to get that um, campaigning awareness and buy-in. I think that, um, I think there's exactly like why you need to involve intersectionality, right? Like, I think the harms that people, the, the harms of like criticism, I think you get, you get the like lack of resources, like <coughs> lack of resources is likely to be a very small, small change and doesn't weigh up. I think you might get, um, you may get this idea from GovBench about like a lack of cohesion on the left, right? Like, you'll keep hearing criticism from a, a good NGO about, um, um, as I said, I think this criticism as we characterize is likely to be fairly constructive. Um, so um, fairly constructive, even if it's not right, I think um, it still brings attention to what we want, which is that like I rather I rather that like um, more people are able to rally and connect with NGOs um, for more nuanced movements than like a larger movement with a lot of disenfranchisement, right? I think this is, intersectionality is important, and it's important that NGOs take this into account. Thank you. denied an abortion in the US because she's more likely to live in a red state with anti-abortion laws because like black communities are likely to be more economically disenfranchised than white, uh, white families, which means they probably are likely to live in the more economically disenfranchised states that have a tendency to be more conservative and have a history uh, 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 of that, right? I think if you're a trans man, you're more likely to be treated in a, in a sexual health way in a way that is gender dysphoric than you are if you're a woman, right? When gun nurture is criticized by lacking diversity in its workforce, that means that when a black woman in Kentucky phones them for advice on where she should go, the white woman who answers her on the phone is just less likely to know what healthcare options are actually available to her. When a trans man asks gun matcher to advocate on his behalf, because at, at, like, you know, the gender affirming medical, there's no gender affirming medical practices or procedures offered at his nearest clinic, at best, gun matcher doesn't know what to do and shuts him down. At worst, gun matcher says that the movement isn't for people like him. I think it's really important that you are able to visualize like, the types of people this debate is about, but to quickly deal with CG. I think aggression is not actually a net negative, right? I think there are probably two types of anger here. One, there's selfish anger that I have been oppressed, and this group who is supposed to be sticking up for me isn't sticking up for me. And then I think there's aggression and frustration on behalf of people who feel that the, this group is not sticking up for someone else who is being oppressed, right? I think that aggression is important because it is galvanizing. When you, are, like, when you are suddenly mad about something on the internet, and other people are like, oh my god, they're mad about it, I'm also mad about that. And, but when the echo chamber echoes, I think it probably becomes murky. That's fine. So you have lots of people spewing random shit about how much they hate their nearest abortion clinic, right? But I think this is the point at which someone else decides to come in, aggregate that strength of feeling into a nice infographic that like, explains everything in detail. They're like, ah, oh, why we dislike uh, a gun matter right now? Gives 10 points in this clear infographic, and everyone posts that on their story, right? I think you've seen this literally happen with every single time a, a conversation gets murky on the internet, right? I think if the discourse makes the NGO feel ashamed, like CG says, and I think their incentive is probably to change. But I think it's not a bad thing that if, if the discourse is as strong and as threatening as CG threatens it, uh, says it is, and our NGO is no longer able to function or it ceases to exist, then I think this is a very large group of people who still want an NGO to exist just to be more representative. And then we think we have better NGOs being raised and supported, and I think we have the financial resources being directed into them. Here's our case. Why NGOs uniquely have an obligation to represent and defend the most vulnerable and disenfranchised version of whom they stand to protect? This is really important because a lot of, like in this case, one stands like aside from the fact of whether or not they're actually able to do this, but I think that they probably are able to do this, right? NGOs are non-governmental, right? This means that they fill in the gap that the government fails to do, like it fails to provide for a certain set of people. This means that because minority groups experience a much greater level of political dissatisfaction than your average Joe white guy, because like, out multiple aspects of their identity are being oppressed, right? But the fact is, everyone in this society still gets one vote. So even though I feel really strongly about my right to not have a baby, and Jason over here feels really strongly, uh, like, well, feels like mid-strongly about my right to, like, forcefully have a baby, 
we still only have one vote. So the intensity of feeling I feel about my cause is not counted by, by like, voting alone. This is really important because this is where NGOs come in. Because people who feel intensely about a social movement can achieve it electorally when they give their trust and buy-in to an NGO who then represents them where their government cannot, right? I think when this occurs on a societal level, you have these big NGOs growing into these big organizations who then are able to access this kind of long-term funding that you get uh, uh, just cited from uh, 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 because Ovo says that ah, when you're an NGO, that means you're necessarily a big organization. I think that's not true. I think there's lots of small NGOs. But I think it is true that there are a couple of NGOs who come to represent a social movement. Right? I, I think that's really, really important. Because when an NGO becomes like gets a large amount of buy-in from a particular group of people, they get tied to the umbrella of that social movement. This is really important because, like, Autism Speaks, for example, was an end, like an NGO that then becomes representative of, like, you know, the, being the people, like, the, the leaders of, like, how to represent neurodivergent people in education. At the point where it actually turns out that Autism Speaks actually is kind of horrible to autistic people, that is the point at which that is problematic for for, for this movement because they are the leaders of, of, of uh, um, like, that people are putting their trust into. Right. I think impacting here is important because it fills in the gap that OO presents to us, where it says, like, ah, okay, but why is the change actually necessary and good? Because the criticism is always going to be constant. Like, why, why uh, is your NGO actually going to be fully represented? One, it is just the fact that the people who are excluded are the most vulnerable and affected targets of the oppression that the NGO is, is working against, right? This is important because if the criticism is effective, and we think it will be effective, and the NGO changes to include them even a little bit, even if suddenly, like, gun matches or fights for, like, there to be more abortion clinics set up in Kentucky, or, like, there is a couple sexual health clinics, like, set up in your state, which are, do offer some kind of gender affirming practice, then that is good, because these are the only, like, institutions who are advocating for this group of people in our society, right? This is a real change for a group of people who no one else has the political gravity to advocate for. Owen says this criticism is constant and inevitable, but this is really unnuanced, because rationally there is a limit to what is expected from each individual NGO. I don't think people criticize gun matter for not being being pro like Black Lives Matter movement as a whole. I think people are criticizing gun matter, even for the inverse side, for not having enough like black employees who know things about like uh, uh, the hotspots in which that like, you know there is more of a need in the black community for uh, um, uh, what's called abortion. I'll take first. Uh, so you successfully identify that voting is imperfect because it doesn't deal with the intensity of emotion. How does an NGO solve this by collating votes or something? Well, the NGO solves this because they are the only people who are advocating for it. I don't think it solves this. I think that you, this is just who you put your trust into when your government is no longer it, when your government is no longer. I think it's just a burden that we place onto NGOs, and it's why we give them trust in our society. So why do we actually think that criticism is effective? Because what Owen says is that if you take criticism from people who you seem to represent, then you learn to allocate your resources better and you just like doing this, right? So why don't you just listen already? Why is like me writing a nice email to Gun Match and being like, hey, you should really have some more black employees? Like, why does why does, what is that a need for the active tarnishing of the uh, of this institution's uh, uh, reputation line? Right? I think there's two reasons. The people who are in charge are often affluent lefties who, like, once were in a bad position and have now gained a good position and now can volunteer and dedicate their time to a cause. I think they have incentives not to publish things that are aligned with their ideology. I think they're usually for, like, wealthy white women, as we've kind of agreed, which means they're kind of insulated from changing ideologies. And I think they're probably quite entitled because they've dedicated a whole bunch of time to this cause, right? Comparatively, people who just support these NGOs are just your regular left wing people. I think the, 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 the truth is that most people on the left want to be perceived as PC and woke and left, right? So it's very effective political criticism when you say, ah, this group that you're supporting is actually not left. I think most people are not actively hateful. I think they're just ignorant. I think when you point out to people that, like, ah, this group that you support is actually not representative of the full spectrum of women who they could be supporting, I think that's pretty effective political critique. Firstly, rejoining our case against what closest governments say. Firstly, they say that if people care so much about a particular group of people, so for example, black people care so much about particular clinics, then they would just set up another NGO. The issue with this response is it's just quite uncharitable to the nature of how NGOs work. There's necessarily a direct trade-off between NGOs. So certain NGOs have more advertising space on social media. They have more funding to be able to get activists and people involved. So at the point at which they have certain amount of like advertising space or like people reposting their posts, then that necessarily means that there's less airspace for other NGOs to gain traction to 
gain funding. So there necessarily is a trade-off, especially for people like staff and stuff like that. But also it probably takes a large scandal for them to stop getting funding. So necessarily on ours of the house, that's the only way in which we can start up the new NGOs, which what closing government agrees is likely a good thing. But I think the second thing is that they say it's unclear why we necessarily need criticism to be able to take out these NGOs, because you can just write them a nice email. The issue is that Esme already preempts this in the last minute of her speech, which closing government doesn't listen to. She says that the people at the top of NGOs, and closing government also weirdly concedes this, are the people who are ideolo ideologically opposed to intersectionality. They're privileged white women who necessarily think that they have dedicated the course to protecting their one cause. They're the people who like are on the same track and they probably dedicated lots of their time and lives doing a particular activity, which means that if people tell them to change and they're unlikely to do so, they're probably necessarily likely to be privileged because, for example, um, they might that like they, they, it probably takes like a lot of time to like quit your job or like a certain amount of money to quit your job and start like volunteering, for example. It's very hard to start up a charity. So this necessarily means that the only way that you get these or NGOs to change is through direct criticism from people, a direct threat to their bottom line, and a direct threat to their capacity to operate as an NGO in the future. The way that we get this criticism is through our calling out mechanisms which we're talking about through the motion. That's necessarily how we're actualizing any sort of change for the NGOs. Esme importantly tells you why this is so necessary, because the most vulnerable people in society are the ones who are on the intersections, the people who are oppressed by multiple different groups in society, which necessarily means that they're just accessing fewer resources. So we care about these people to the greatest extent in the debate. CG are unnuanced when they say we care about victims, but presumably we care about certain victims to a greater extent because they're far more oppressed. The way that our calling out mechanism works is that we say that if people buy into this calling out, then that necessarily means that staff want to work with you for a lesser extent. People who are fairly entitled don't want to work for an institution or an organization which is seen as being corrupt. Big funders don't want to be associated with an organization which is being called out for having scandals, for being anti-diverse. Because probably the reason why big funders are investing in you is because they want to be seen as woke or liberal so that like woke people buy their products. So probably that just happens to a far lesser extent at the point to which they're getting called out willy-nilly. Now, let's deal with closing government, or actually let's deal with opening government. First of all, I think they say that pe most people are not intersectional and then people are going to buy out. The issue is this is just blatantly untrue, right? Probably, firstly, people reach leftist media to a certain extent, right? This is your average show. No, importantly, not the privileged white people or like privileged people at the top of NGOs that we were talking about earlier. Most people read leftist media. So, for example, someone might read The Guardian, which doesn't obviously just talk about abortion. It talks about lots of different things. People read, like, watch YouTube channels, which tells you about an array of leftist issues. But also, you can probably have, like, different groups of friends who like tell you about their issues as well. But also lots, also lots of ideology cross applies. So for example, oppression and the idea of alienation applies both through like feminist ideology, but also anti-capitalist ideology. So lots of different people can buy into these different things. So it's unclear why this is necessarily a thing which different people buy into. But this importantly, or the implication of this, is it's unlikely that people act as irrationally as open government and closing government talk about. Because presumably if people care about things or different like organizations, um, like even if they're not necessarily a part of that protected group, then that necessarily means that they're unlikely to like ravage those, savage those groups on our side of the house as well. Because they still care about the abortion, like charities being able to function. So they probably don't have that great of an incentive to just call them out if they are intersectional. But it's also unclear on opening government why they stop fulfilling their purpose as well because of this. Because why are some, why is like an NGO which is about abortion suddenly going to start talking about like diversity and promoting diversity? I think that was the burden that opening government tried to meet. I think it's just very unclear clear why this is likely to happen. But also presumably if the people are like caring about these vastly different issues as opposed to like abortion which is gobbling up other different abortion charities, then you probably do have some amount of capacity to fund a different organization. So maybe you can fund like a diversity NGO as opposed to a pro or anti-abortion NGO. Um, yeah, cool. Lastly dealing or actually dealing with opening opposition now, because as you know, I'll deal with closing government. I think you're just quite uncharitable and have some sort of like 2014 like SJW mindset about this motion because they're like there's tons of crazy woke people on Twitter who are doing like toxic discourse um, and that necessarily means to like that necessarily harms NGOs, but also NGOs are crazy. We agree with that one. I think there are three issues with this. 
Firstly, I think it's unclear why this characterization is necessarily an effective way to do this. Because if people are acting as irrationally and as crazy on Twitter as closing government talk about, there are tons of narratives which disavow these types of people in society. These people get called Karens or like social justice warriors on Twitter for acting in crazy ways. Which means that importantly, there's not some sort of broad movement which settles and supports people who are acting, asking for irrational things which are going to harm social movements. This means that like sensible and important claims rise to the top because you're likely to get retweets and likes. They see why the individual is likely to want to get make these posts to get Twitter likes. But it's unclear why other people are liking these posts if they're harming the movement which they support to such a great extent. So you think it's just unclear why they're able to access that benefit. Sure. Oh, off bench can't reasonably engage with CG's case and PM's premise that said and Joe's came into pressure from fear of losing support. This is textbook knifing. No, I'm telling you why people are likely to engage in this in a sensible in, in a sensible way because they're not likely to engage in crazy people who are online. So like the people who are doing this. The second thing is the intersectionality thing that I said above. But thirdly, weighing on why, like for example, we probably care more about the people that Esme talk about than like harming a social movement to an extent. Lastly, weighing over opening opposition. I think the first thing is that we tell you why it's necessary for criticism to actualize to be able to harm these social movements. Because we talk about the people who are at the top of social movements who are resistant to change, which means importantly you have to publicly criticize them rather than write an email. This is a burden that opening opposition needed to prove. But secondly, we give you better impacting. We said that what we told you why it's so necessary to actively even risk harming an NGO or, or, or a social movement to like better the cause. Because we want to protect the most vulnerable people. Opening opposition hinted this, but they don't actually tell you why these people matter or why we should care about them. And they're actually quite vague about this. And as we tell you, this is because social movements have a responsibility to protect the people who are the most intensely harmed in society because they can't help themselves by voting because necessarily everybody gets one vote. So you can't demonstrate intensity through this. So the NGO has a responsibility to demonstrate intensity by helping the most vulnerable people in society. The only way we can do this is by getting criticism. And the only way you get this is on closing opposition. Everyone, thank you all very much for that debate. We're going to give you your feedback and that's the result, go through the reasons for that result. I think the first thing I want to send you a feedback, I think there's large parts of this debate that is missed by, by all four teams in the debate that could have made the debate, I think, a bit more in, in, engaged from both teams, but also, I think, covered a lot more ground and a lot more useful in the debate. I think the big thing here is, um, I think it's a very big question of, like, what... So this debate kind of is really insular, right, on, on like what happens to the NGOs and the people who are critiquing it, which, to be fair, is a very valid part of the debate. I think there's also a lot of space to expand the debate outside and what like leftist critique of what are leftist bodies does for a broader political interaction. Like, does this give moral licensing to right-wing bodies to critique it more and has therefore created more harm? Does this delegitimize those bodies in the eyes of the left and the right? Thinking about more maybe moderate people who are on the fence of breaking down these people a little bit more, I think would help expand the debate a bit more into what this critique has actually done. So then, I, I, I guess from, from Af, who's like more harm, doing the more harm side, is a bit more description of like why um, any sort of critique level is her, like, uh, an imperfect but good body in the pursuit of a perfect body is actually more harmful to the overall movement. Uh, and similarly, or I guess not similarly, conversely from the op, why um, that critique from the left is actually likely to be a far preferable thing because it, it, compared to what the right is or why that doesn't actually shift the, the balance of power in the right or the moderates as much because they're already kind of locked into their view. I think there's a bit more scope to explain, a bit more there. Um, second piece of general fee. I'll, oh, sorry, obviously, be clear on that. Like, that doesn't impact the decision because it doesn't come up in the debate. That's just thoughts for future debates. So I think a bit bigger as well about the impact of talking about. Second piece of general feedback about the debate itself. I think teams need to do a lot more work on being responsive to each other. I think at times teams were uh, just missing large chunks of responses from other teams, which hurt their capacity to engage properly. Um, so I think making sure you are targeting the big thoughts of each team, the big issues, and trying to explain why your material actually attach, attaches to that. I think at times it's maybe left a bit up to judges to sort of assume or make those connections. Um, better off being far more explicit about how this thing responds to that or make sure it actually is engaged with. Um, and the third thing is that um, what this debate uh, lacked at times was actually just a really clear breakdown of who is doing the critique, how does that critique look like, what are the responses to that critique. Um, so I think when you, any sort of motion that involves like a, a critique or a messaging or a norm or something like that, really sitting down sitting through exactly what that characterization looks like, because large parts of the debate, like the harms and the benefits, are actually entirely contingent upon what this critique looks like and how people respond to it, because if we don't prove that, then the impacts are like floating, I guess, with our connections. All right, in terms of the results, then we eventually came to a consensus decision with the first going to closing government, 
second going to opening government, the third going to opening opposition, and the fourth, unfortunately, going to closing opposition. Let's go through the reasons for that now. I want to start with explaining why closing government takes the first in today's debate. I think let's look at what they do in their extension. I think the first thing they bring out in their extension is this idea of what the critique actually looks like um, and explain why it's likely to be done poorly. Um, so the fact that people like are done in echo chambers, they're on a rise, they want to be harsh and cathartic. Um, and, and I think that explains why it's likely to also target victims in some sense, because it hits um, sort of victims who are working in that organisation or who are a part of it or exposed to it. Uh, and then secondly, I think what they do very well is explain um, what the reaction is likely to be that. So like people feel an attack on their identity, people feel that like leaders then feel like they're attacked, so they want to back down, so they don't, they don't concede to these changes. And also that like workers are also socialised to believe they're doing good, so also sort of reject the critique and reject the pushback. This is all particularly important and useful in the debate. I think first because it's the, it's, it's the clearest picture from any team in the debate about how the critique looks and operates. That has a couple of impacts in terms of, uh, I, I think firstly, being out opening government by really explaining like what it actually looks like, giving detail on how it operates, which then allows us to more easily believe the harms that come from that. Um, I'll come to the harms, we talk about bad victims in a second, but I think that, that bit of characterization is actually really crucial for firstly describing, uh, getting to their impact. I think secondly, um, it also shows, um, I, I think it's able to push back really effectively against uh, both opposition teams. So while both opposition teams, I think, explain really well the benefits of having that degree of intersectionality and the benefits of people listening to it, it is the first step about why people would be so lucky to listen to it or why they could be done in a way that makes people receptive to engage with those changes. I think it's those steps that are missing from, from both op teams, which means that when we, we, we lack that lack in with that lack in characterization, Closing government is the team that fills that gap and therefore it creates a blocker to achieving the impacts that both opposition team wants about more uh, inclusive um, uh, teams. I think at both times, at various teams on the opposition bench talk things about things like we well, want to be perceived as being uh, 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 woke, we want to be perceived as being doing good, or you care about the community, you care about the um, uh, the, the, the NGO that you're working for, which I think is all true, but also is none of what CG is critique, like not, not, not what CG is flashing here. It's like CG is saying you, because you feel like you care about, it, because you feel like you're doing the right thing, and because you feel like you, you, you're a leader who's been made this identity, um, that's why you're a rebuke. So it's not as if they, so it's like um, these people still feel like they're doing the good work by rejecting this criti criticism and not engaging with it overall. So I think given that characterization, it makes it a lot harder for all the op benches claims to get up. I think the second thing then that opening, uh, sorry, the closing government does well is able to identify then how this harms people, or how it harms the victims. So people who are often directly attacked and um, because they feel like they're, they're part of the organization, they feel like they're being, uh, attacked as being uh, involved in it, um, but also then they may, and also like, you know, they're being, it's bad to make a victim feel like they are a less important victim vis-a-vis -vis someone else, especially in those times of vulnerability, and then also impact that vulnerability quite well. I think what we needed on this victim stuff was more direct engagement, I guess, particularly from CO, as to why the critique that we're talking about doesn't hit the victims or the vulnerable people we are, we, we're engaging with in the debate. I think CO does get close on this and has some mechanisms around like, well, you have the, the sort of angry initial everyone piling on that's then presented in a nicer infographic and that's what's given out. I guess that's probably true to some extent and probably this and the next couple of things I mentioned do attempt to mitigate um, the closing government a little bit. But the problem is, is, is one, it's not shown how like that discourse still, like the initial part of discourse is still locked away in a way that means other victims or other people can't access that. So maybe they get the infographic at the end, but then they get all the stuff in the middle and whether or not that also uh, uh, impacts them as well. I think the second thing they, that, that uh, CG talks about um, uh, is the way that, um, uh, what did I want to say here? Um, sorry, CO, I should say. Um, Oh, is that like, oh, this is stuff on anger, yes. So the, the, the second response C, CEO gives here is the stuff on like, well, actually anger is okay sometimes. It's okay to be to be angry and feel galvanized about the way you're operating. Again, I think that that is like a fair justification of the emotion of feeling anger, but I think it doesn't respond to the ways in which CG identifies that that is likely to be like felt badly by the NGO and those receiving it, um, but also like done in a productive way. Like, like maybe you feel angry, but if it doesn't end up having a good outcome, then it doesn't actually uh, end up being doing doing more harm than good. So ultimately, I think we'll end up to try and sum all that up at the end. I think what closing government's explained here is the way in which this critique has operated has generated an environment where more harm has occurred uh, than what has good, which means that even if some do, some of that change that office talked about has gotten through, even if there are some good people in those NGOs who are receptive to it, um, that is still outweighed by the, the bigger harm that uh, closing government has caused. Let's then talk about the two three split in the top half of the debate. Um, so I think the, um, the, 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 the there's an interesting clash here, I guess, about what this critique has actually led to and what the impact that it, what it has done 
uh, to NGOs. And I think this is this was a, a split we went back and forth on. I think quite a lot um, uh, in in the deliberation because I guess both teams are claiming that this this action of critique um, uh, loses the group. So opening government's claim is that. Um, there's a group of people who no longer support the NGO because they feel like it's drifting away from its mission or it's not achieving its outcomes or it's not doing the purpose it's meant to do because it's trying to fix a bunch of different problems that all can't be solved by the same group, but by, by, by focusing on intersectionality. Um, and, and from opening opposition, there's a claim that well, there's a bunch of people who would no longer support or donate or contribute to NGOs because they feel like they're not being intersectional enough and not doing enough to, uh, to, 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 to help that group. I guess the problem we have here from both teams is the question of like, we're unsure which group is bigger. We're unsure about which group, what, what, which group is having more impact or more power uh, in the debate. I don't think either teams do enough work to identify why that is likely to be the case or why that is likely to um, uh, to, to, to change anything. I think at that point, then we are inclined to believe. I think uh, I think opening government does provide a bit more analysis as to why people are likely to be less engaged in NGOs the more they feel like the actual mission or vision isn't being accomplished because it's bringing in too many exterior things and is like diluting and, and, and not grappling properly with the nuance. We think opening government does have some good material on why like these things are nuanced. There are intersections here, but again, it's like m maybe in some cases that is true. Maybe in some cases opening government's true. I think what then ultimately ends up being the extra flip point for the opening government team is explaining, I guess, the effectiveness of this. And they make some claims as to why in lots of specific cases, uh, bringing in an in intersectional focus to the way in which we solve problems is not likely to actually be effective in solving those problems. And it's actually likely to, to, to cloud the message and cloud the effectiveness uh, involved. So I think on the, on the effectiveness of these bodies then, um, they're able to get, uh, I, I, I think, split that deadlock a bit on, on where we were a bit unsure about which is likely to have more or less critique or more or, or, or less impact then. So, and then I think there's the last thing I think I'd say on the, on the, on the top half here is then when it comes to like the, the effectiveness of the, the, the critique. Um, so from a problem position, like, well, now you critique, you get more or less support, you get more people likely to act, I think does also revolve around like, need to do more to prove exactly how this critique flows through the organization, why they're so receptive to it and the changes that are likely to be made. I just don't think that is present there. So we think that opening government is able to narrowly prove a bigger harm that occurs and, and therefore prove that the, the, the greater harm than there has been good in the debate. Lastly, let's look at closing opposition then. I think I'll note firstly the positive uh, contribution we did like from closing opposition. We think closing opposition does give a very, I think, I, I, I guess, to, uh, a very good set of impacting that really grounds what we're talking about here in terms of like gender affirming care or, or black women trying to access abortion clinics in, in predominantly conservative white states. I think what that does that is useful and, and is credited is gives the debate a bit of like a real world picture of what we're actually talking about here and where it impacts, etc. I think then there's the, the, the next two parts where the COK starts to fall down in today's debate. The first of those is then uh, a lot of the material on them because they are critiqued. Um, People the charged, privileged white people at the top of those bodies then change and change and adapt to that critique is stuff that is already present in the open opposition case that like like the left people who care will see the critique, see that they see that it's causing harm, then fix themselves to change that without I think adding a whole different set of mechanisms to why that occurs. Maybe better impacting or different impacting to why that is good that it's occurred, but also it's the same set of reasons why it has occurred. Um, without necessarily expanding on them or updating those responses to engage the material we've heard later from the government bench about why that is not likely to be the case. I think then the second thing um, is that while, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is some good responses or some mitigation as to why like the critique may be like anger is good or the people will likely be supported because they, they want to be left wing, they want to support the people. There's still a big gap then of how the critique as characterised by opening, by closing government rather, then leads to the, the amount of change and impacting that closing opposition wants to get in today's debate. I think that's that link in the middle there that makes us harder to see the connection. So while we agree with the, all the benefits of this thing occurring, we're not necessarily convinced that this critique is operating in such a way that it would lead to those outcomes. We need a, a stronger pushback on exactly how this critique operates, who the critique is directed to, and why it's not likely to impact victims as much. I think those sort of things there might have helped flip that or change that direction a little bit, but absent those, I think there's still a, a problem solution gap present in the closing opposition case. Um, and therefore, I think that means it's unable to get up over their, their, their closing or their opening, but then also comparing to, to opening government. I think. At uh, least opening government has a clear connection from what, what they think the problem is uh, and then how the model impacts that and creates that additional harm and that's why they're able to get up. I hope that all made sense. Thank you all again for a really good debate and best of luck for the last round of Euros. Um, feedback and questions, very happy to do that as we walk back to dinner.